Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. This is the M1 iPad Air and a lot has changed with this since I bought it almost exactly one year ago. When I first got the fifth gen iPad Air, I was really excited about the M1 being put into it, having on the previous version with the A series chip and it being relatively affordable as well, starting at $599, which to this day is still the cheapest entry point to an M series chip. At that time, I was thinking about all these different use cases that would pop up and how it would really open up performance on these devices and offer a lot of value, and that only turned out to be partially true. Today, I want to dive into what it's been like with the iPad Air over the last year, what I've loved about it, and what's been disappointing. So if you're considering picking one of these up or you already own one and you want to compare notes, stick around. Together, we'll explore the good, the bad, and the mysterious world of the iPad Air 5. I left a mess everywhere. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> They're even in my water. All right, so I did buy the M1 iPad Air on launch, and even though I've tried out a whole bunch of different iPads over the last year, the Air has been the one that I've been using pretty much every day since I've owned it. I got this because of how portable it is and the added power that just adds to the overall versatility. Uh, I previously had the fourth gen Air, which is identical to this model looks wise. So I kind of knew what to expect from the design. It's got a nice minimal look and the colors that you can select from are pretty decent as well, unlike the 10th gen iPad. I've got the Starlight model and it's held up really well. I haven't experienced any scuffing or scratching. Uh, admittedly, it has been in a case almost its whole life, especially if I have been traveling, but even around the USB-C port that is exposed and gets used quite often, there's no wear or marking there. In contrast to that, one thing that I've never done is put a screen protector on here, and with using the Apple Pencil and my fingers, I've never had any problems with scratching on the display either. Now, that being said, if you throw this in a bag with your keys or something and no front cover, you can likely expect it to get marked up, but in my experience, as long as you're careful, it holds up really well. I'm not a huge fan of screen protectors on the iPad, especially with the Air, because it does take away from some of the features and functionality of the device. It's got a laminated display, meaning that the touch surface and the actual display are fused together. So when you're taking notes or drawing on the screen, it feels really natural and a lot more accurate. There's also an anti-reflective coating on here that does a fantastic job and is immediately noticeable if you compare it to other iPads without it, but if you put a screen protector on here, you kind of negate both of those things. As long as you're careful, the scratch resistant glass that's on here seems to work well enough. And having that anti-reflective coating is great for bright areas in both daylight and bright artificial light. But that screen goes up to 500 nits, which is reasonably bright for a display this size, but it is only a 60 hertz display versus the 120 hertz that you see in the Pro models. I did want to mention this specifically for folks who use Pro iPhones and who might be shopping for iPads. If you're on one of those devices often throughout the day and you move over to the iPad Air, chances are you'll probably notice it's not quite as smooth and depending on who you are that may or may not bother you. It's by no means a deal breaker for me. I don't notice it a ton but where I do see it the most is where I'm scrolling through menus and screens but if I'm watching content which is what I do most of the time on here it still looks fantastic. The color accuracy is great. It is a liquid retina display so there is an IPS panel that isn't going to have as deep of blacks as an OLED but for an IPS, it does get pretty dark. It's a touch darker than the 10th gen iPad, and I love using this as a second display when I'm editing videos. Because the color is accurate, and I find it looks very similar to an iPhone, I love to extend this out as a monitor and just run everything through here when I'm finishing up these videos. This is something that I never used to really bother with because my iPad placement always kind of felt awkward with kickstand cases, but I've been using this Banks Infinity Stand lately, which is adjustable, and that I can set up to sit like a legit external monitor, so it is a lot more functional in that regard. Full disclosure, Banks is the sponsor of this video. They sent me this product about a month and a half ago, and before I put it into a video, I wanted to make sure that the quality was good and that I could get behind it, and by all accounts, it's been outstanding. It's a full metal build, and it's very sturdy. Your iPad just snaps into place with the magnets on the back, similar to how the Magic Keyboard does if you've ever used one of those. It's got these two joints on the top and the bottom to adjust the height and the angle. And you can rotate both the iPad and the stand as well. Uh, the stand rotates with this tactile click, which is actually really satisfying to play with. 
I love that sound. My iPad is on here 99% of the time now. If you're looking for a stand like this, I can definitely recommend this one. I will drop a link below for it, but as far as how I use my iPad in terms of video editing, this is kind of where I hit my limit. I think for myself and a lot of people, having an M1 in here does open up a lot of possibilities for video editing and doing a lot more with this performance wise. And after a full year, you could kind of do more with it. First off, any games that you run on here outside of the 60 Hertz display limitation are gonna be buttery smooth. I haven't done a ton of gaming on here, but when I have, there have been no issues there whatsoever. I was hoping we'd see software development options open up on here with rumors that have been swirling for what seems like an eternity with Xcode coming to iPad, but that's never happened. And also with Final Cut Pro. We did see DaVinci release Resolve for iPad, which is great to see. Uh, you do have LumaFusion, which a lot of folks like, but I still generally stay away from iPad editing. First off, editing video on the iPad for a lot of folks is gonna work just fine, especially when you're getting started out. With the M1, you've got a dedicated media engine and a lot of power, so dealing with files and rendering out videos is gonna be pretty snappy. I can see this being really handy for quick edits if you're on the go or if your timeline is really light. Maybe you're editing short form videos or something like that, but oftentimes for me, uh, I'm not on the go when my timeline for these videos can get pretty bogged down with a lot of stuff that even drags down the Pro Max quite a bit. On top of that, you're probably gonna need some kind of external storage device. There's no chance that a video like this is ever going to fit on the maxed out 256 gig internal drive on the Air. And in my experience, those drives don't run particularly well on the Air either. I did a video surrounding external storage for the iPad a couple of weeks back and iPad OS isn't the greatest with getting the most out of these external drives. You'll almost always see faster speeds on a Mac or PC and you do only have one port available, which does complicate things a little. If I wanna run any of these apps on an external display, which is highly likely considering how cramped everything gets on this 11 inch screen, I can now do that with full external monitor support, but because I only have one port that runs at 10 gigabits per second on the air, regardless of if I'm using a hub or not, monitors and external drives are gonna use a lot of that bandwidth up. So I'm gonna have to make some sacrifices somewhere when it comes to the bandwidth available on that port. Outside of that, if we look just specifically at the software side of things, that external monitor support is something that wasn't available when this launched and it's great for expanding what the M1 iPad Air can do or how it's used. All of this is made possible through Stage Manager, which is only available on the M series iPads and didn't show up in a public release until the fall, I believe, outside of the beta versions, and has slowly become more stable and usable since it came out. The last time I looked at Stage Manager in any length on the channel, I think it was still in beta and it was pretty buggy for a long time. It's gotten a lot better, but every once in a while, it does still get a bit janky, depending on what apps you're using and how you're using them. Having said that, it does open up a lot of functionality, and I know a lot of folks like using it with an external monitor to pull up work stuff on the monitor, while also utilizing the touch feedback on the iPad display for other applications or multitasking. For me, I also like to use Stage Manager when I'm not even connected to a monitor, the only thing I think makes sense to change in that regard is just to go into your settings and remove the tiles off on the left side of the screen. Otherwise, it just takes up a little bit too much screen real estate, especially on an 11 inch screen, but this allows me to full screen apps or have multiple windows open at once if I want. Everything regardless of what app you have open is all very snappy, but it can have a pretty big impact on battery life. This is one area that I'm not entirely sold on with the iPad Air. I've been closely monitoring this in preparation for this video, and I really wish that iPadOS just listed your battery capacity like it does on macOS and iOS. I'm not sure why they don't, but with third-party software monitoring my battery life, I'm getting just over six hours screen on time. That's mostly watching YouTube, and I do have the brightness on the display cranked up all the way, so it will be better if I turn that down a bit. But if you try to do anything in DaVinci Resolve or you have an external drive that you're running on here, it can really suck the power back. So if you're planning on doing those things or really anything resource heavy, I just make sure that you have access to power. And if you're using an external drive, maybe use a USB hub with pass-through power. I do still think that this is a great little device and it does kind of live in that middle ground between something for super casual use like watching movies or playing games to doing some more heavy lifting. For me, that's perfect because I'm gonna use my Macs for most of that heavy lifting, but 
Having the laminated display for taking notes and design work is much nicer on here than the iPad 10. And if I am ever in a bind or stuck somewhere and all I have is the iPad, I know I can still get resource heavy stuff done in a pinch. One year later, it's still holding up really well with wear, everyday use and general functionality. Uh, in this day and age, I'd like to see that port spec bumped up a little bit more from 10 gigabits per second because I think it would really help with taking advantage of the M1 chip more. It's a bit of a bottleneck, but overall, I have very little frustrations with the fifth gen iPad Air. I'd love to hear from everyone else who maybe has the Air, the Pro, or even the regular iPad. And what has your experience been like? What are you using it for? And if you've had it for an extended period of time like I have with this model, what are some of the things that you love about yours and some things that you wish were different? Let me know in the comments down below. As always, if you enjoy this video, feel free to hit that like button. If you wanna see more tech related content or if you wanna dress up like Nicolas Cage and do yoga with goats, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.